I'm really happy to um, have Youngjin here at our MLCB seminars today. Uh, so Youngjin is recently um, an assistant professor in the Department of Statistics and Pathology, I believe. Is that right? Yes. Uh, uh, University of British Columbia, which where I was um, <laughs> last year, um, when we never got, got to intersect when we were there. Um, and um, before that, so Youngjin did his uh, postdoc with Manolis Kellis and um, at, at MIT, where he worked on statistical genetics um, and causal inference. Before that, he um, did a PhD in um, Johns Hopkins with Joel Bader, uh, working on networks and network inference and things like that. Um, and before that, um, he did his um, BSc, I believe, was it in computer science? Um, uh, yeah, primarily I studied uh, bio, biology, but I kind of, I, so I, I, yeah, I ended up doing both, yeah. Yeah, in Seoul National University. So um, today he's going to tell us about causal inference in single cell genomics, a very um, relevant and important topic uh, for today for, you know, like um, kind of what's happening in the field of genomics. So really happy to have you here, Yangjun. Please take it away. Okay, thank you. Thank you for a wonderful introduction, uh, wonderful audience. So today I'll be talking about uh, mostly two things. Uh, first, the causal inference and single cell genomics. Hopefully I can blend them well together. So here's the outline of today's talk. So first I'll be introducing some basic concepts of causal inference framework. Um, in this talk, I'll be mostly talking about uh, Rubin's causal outcome, uh, uh, potential outcome models. And I'll also give you some toy example so that uh, you can also, you can understand better. And then in the end, uh, I'll be briefly mention about the outcome regression model so that a lot of people these days are using. And then we switch the topic to single cell differential expression analysis. And then we'll discuss on more biological context. Then if I have time, I'll also talk about cell type annotation problems in single cell RNA-seq. So uh, first uh, let's define Precisely, uh, what is a causal inference? Uh, causal inference is a kind of big term um, and there are a lot of concepts that are sort of convoluted. So here's an excerpt. I took it from one of the uh, review paper uh, from uh, Tyler Vanderwill. It's on the Peter Settles, the nice paper. So the, he clearly defines that there's a two types of causal inference. First is the causal effect inference and the second one is a causal discovery inference. So what I mean by that is uh, causal effect literature is mostly you have a causal graph. It's already given by scientists or epidemiologists or some biologists. Um, then you have a data matrix, X and Y, for example. Then your outcome that you wanna get at is a causal effect, which is I denoted by tau. Tau hat is your primary concern. This will be a, a focus of this talk, uh, but there's other class of causal inference. I think it's more familiar with uh, to uh, computational biologists because uh, we have a data, a lot of uh, microarray data or protopsic data, and then the outcome output is basically we want to infer causal graph. Uh, it's uh, entirely out of uh, data, so this is a more um, ambitious goal. But uh, however, th uh, this talk is primarily focusing on this uh, causal effect inference. Yes, please go ahead. I just wanted to, could you clarify that what kind of a thing is the tau hat? Is that just a, a weight or is it a vector? Or what, what is it that we're inferring? In that? Yes, it can be both parametric and non-parametric. So in, in, in for simplicity in the structural graphical model setting, um, we can say it's a regression coefficient. So, I yeah. See. Okay. okay, so in, in a causal effect inference, there's also two flavors. Uh, uh, so the first class is, uh, I, I will call them experimentalists. They, they love interventions. What they are interested in is uh, measuring probability of outcome Y when you do uh, some experiment, when you do set X to some little X and what will be the probability of your outcome. So this, and what they are actually interested in is uh, trying to make this uh, probability of y given do x 
equal to probability y given f. So this is a conditional probability. So the one thing we can distinguish is that the first one is more like a concept of doing experiment. And the second one is, a, is a mostly passively observing your uh, relationship between x and y. So definitely Julia Pearl is one of the, the leading figure of this, uh, this causal effect inference. Uh, but it was originally coined by uh, C. Wall Wright, and then also it has a deep root to uh, R.A. Fisher. So in, in this talk, uh, then uh, I'll be mostly, I'm, I'm I would love to introduce a counterfactual reasoning because this is a well accepted in the statistics field, but it's, I don't think it's really well introduced in uh, genomics uh, researches. So I think it's a, but I think it's a very interesting framework. So here, here's a different flavor. So first one, uh, first uh, we have uh, X and Y. In this case, X is your cause and then Y is your uh, effect. And then they will, uh, the, the goal is to figure out what's the difference when you uh, give X equals to one, when you give X equals to zero. So in normally uh, we don't really have both in uh, observational studies. So for example, you have a, your, your drug is given, it's a X equals one, your drug is not given, could be X equals zero, then what's the outcome of your, of your health, Y? So you don't really have both. But so in, in this case, your observed Y is actually the result of, it, it's really depending on your label assignment. So when you are given with the drug X equals one, then you have a YI a potential outcome of one. And then when you're not given drug, so that's, that's gonna be your, um, our potential outcome of uh, zero. So the idea is uh, we want to know both for each individual, that's the goal. So it, it's actually much clearer when you look at the uh, data. Um, so the, before we dig in to the data, I will first try to uh, introduce some notations. So um, throughout the talk, I'll be using X as a sort of a covariance. So it could be exogenous variable, some pretreatment variable, some covariates. This X can uh, affect both your assignment W. So it could be disease assignment, it could be a drug assignment and your outcome, which that can be your uh, uh, some measurement of your health. So WI is assignment variable. WI equals zero means you are in the control. WI equals one. That means you are uh, in the active treatment group. And YI is the observed outcome for a unit I. So it's it's really the function of the WI. So the definition here, I introduce uh, Rubin's potential outcome uh, framework is. Uh, yi of zero is a potential outcome under your assignment were zero. wi of one is a potential outcome under wi equals one. So in, in reality, um, you have a say that you have a six individuals and then you have a you know, label assignment, a zero one. And you only have a one, at, at most one of your potential outcomes. So for this individual one, you have a YI, that's your observation, because you are assigned in a control group, then your, your observation is only one uh, YI of Y1 of zero. And on the other hand, uh, for this treatment group, you, you don't have observation for the control uh, potential outcomes. So, so if you're in a disease group, uh, so basically, or treated group, uh, you have an observation of gene expression, for example, is uh, YI of one, you're missing uh, the counterpart, which we call a counterfactual. This is a factual, this is a counterfactual. For on the other hand, the control group, you have a, this is your factual, your observation, and this is a counterfactual. And ideally, the, we want to measure the effect, which is uh, in this case, just defined as a difference between the treated group versus untreated group. So for each individual. So, and there's a famous quote by Holland. Uh, it, it's really saying the fundamental problem of uh, case control, causal inference problem is, is basically it's a imputation problem. You have a big matrix, you need to fill in those uh, 
question marks that you're that is a uh, sort of the goal of the potential uh, potential outcome and um, uh, here's a, the and then to in order to proceed so we uh, technically there's no way you can actually impute those missing values unless you have a multiverse so so the that we have to uh, draw some uh, add some assumptions to tackle this in a more statistical way First, uh, we have to assume that the treatment is uh, stable for each unit. So you have a causal outcome of, for example, the causal outcome of mine is actually independent of yours. So, you know, I don't, I don't get to have disease uh, just because my uh, some distant neighbors have disease. So, so something like that. So it's, it's more or less IID type of assumption for causal inference. And there's a strong ignorability assumption with, this is a little, uh, I think the terminology is a, is a little bit confusing because it's a strong conditional probe, conditional ignorability. And also, it also means that the, your potential outcome of uh, whether if you are treated, if you are treated or if you are not treated is independent of your actual label assignment given some covariance. This is a, this is actually this was this was actually pretty uh, confusing to me at, at first, but now it, it's uh, the idea is uh, the your potential outcome is actually sort of inherent mechanism of uh, disease, for example, or or treatment. So it's nothing to do with the actual assignment to you. So your potential outcome are independent of assignment within as long as you are in the homogeneous uh, population. So some stratum of confounding factors. So that's a strong ignorability. This is a very, very critical uh, assumption. In, in many cases, this holds, I guess. So, because we're not really claiming the observation of why it, uh, is independent of some uh, assignment given X. We are only assuming the potential outcome is uh, independent of the assignment given some uh, covariance, okay? And uh, the last assumption is, uh, yeah, within each bin of X uh, stratified by some covariate X, there is a non-zero probability. So that means uh, within each covariate uh, binning group, uh, there is a both there is a both treated and untreated uh, uh, individuals. So the the it'll be much clearer if I discuss more on the toy example. So here's, I kind of made up this toy example. So, you know, don't, don't feel uh, offended if you're a medical doctor. So the, you know, so the, it's a kind of hypothetical scenario. So there's a drug company that they made some uh, new supplement that can reduce uh, your amyloid beta protein in your brain. So, so it was a uh, pretty sensational at, at some point. And a clinician thought, oh yeah, I will describe this drug to uh, my patients uh, with uh, you know, which is actually W equals one based on their age, which makes sense because the, uh, you know, younger people, you don't really have AD, you don't really have a risk of AD. So they, they so the clinician decided to do that anyways. So mathematically, it's more like uh, there's some probability uh, of assigning WI equals one given XI in this case is aging is a sort of like a logistic function, for example. And then in the observation of your uh, amyloid beta measure, somehow measure in some sense, it's a sort of like a linear combination. So of both a treatment effect of this drug supplement, and then also the aging effect, Xi times beta. So the, however, the, you know, the correlation based study is a sort of the disappointing uh, with, so if you look at the amyloid beta of a treated group and the untreated group, it looks like it's, it's going the opposite way because your amyloid beta is increasing. So, which is disappointing. And then if you also look at the correlation between the age and the amyloid beta, then it's also increasing. So it looks like uh, there's something funny is going on. So, so then the uh, a statistician came in and then, so, and then he asked, uh, you know, how did you assign your drug to patients? So, so it's, yeah, 
and then the and then he looked at the logistic regression uh, as a function of uh, treatment uh, as a function of standardized age then you can see clearly bias treated and untreated and then if you fit, fit some uh, propensity function which is the probability of wi equals one given x is sort of like a logistic curve so all the people they tend to have more drugs uh, more subscribe uh, prescribe more drugs so yeah, then obviously the defense book from the clinician is yes, yeah, because they don't need a drug for young people. Um, so, but if you see the color uh, treated and untreated, there's a clearly trend of age uh, as a function uh, uh, with the amyloid beta. And then there's a clear difference between treated and untreated. So then the, if you have done some randomized control trial really and then you assign the drug uh, randomly without uh, stratifying the a uh, aging age, then you would see this effect. Uh, so treated and untreated. So definitely treated would decrease your uh, the level of amyloid beta. But uh, yeah, the, here's the point. Uh, so, and then let's uh, investigate what went wrong in, in this study. Uh, then I, let's pull out some uh, out, you know, some some extreme cases. For example, this untreated group, extremely young and uh, untreated, comparing these guys, as opposed to the treated and the old, very old people. Is it is it okay to compare between this and that? It's yeah. Our uh, obvious intuition is no because they're they're totally different age extreme, and then the, it's it's not fair to compare this and that. So the idea is that if you have uh, ran, if you have so randomized, we want to achieve the randomized control trial by uh, somehow fixing our data set. So then how do you do that? Is uh, if you have prescribed less on the older people, which means you are, you, you probably, you need, you should have sampled more on these people. Uh, if you have, uh, if you have, uh, prescribe more on younger people. Oh, sorry, I said it the other way. So if you have not prescribed on the older people, if you have prescribed on the younger people, then you will see more points on this regime. So that's something that we wanna fix. And then how do you do that? It's basically, how, how about you uh, inversely weight your observations? So the, we fit the propensity function, which is a logistic curve. How about we weight each point inversely with the propensity for the treated group and the untreated group? So, so basically, and then the surprisingly, this uh, will converge to the actual causal effect of treated versus untreated uh, um, in a consistent manner, statistically. So then, yeah, that's that's how you fix it. This is a this sort of technique is called inverse probability weighting. So why why inverse probability weighting works? Uh, first, uh, uh, we have to show that it's unbiased estimate of potential outcome. So expectation of your y if you are treated, expectation of y if you are untreated. So then we have to show that this goes to this, this uh, the other one goes to the other. So. So the, I think the math is pretty straightforward. Uh, if you are familiar with the assumptions, the causal assumptions we made. So the, uh, first we can actually take the, you know, can break the uh, marginal expectation into conditional expectation. And then uh, as a given X, and then we can introduce the uh, Y of one through pull out because it's, it's, uh, it's not, it's already given, it is observed. Uh, and then the, there's a, based on the strong ignorability, we can, uh, we can uh, yes, so based on the strong ignorability, we can uh, assume that the W is independent of uh, potential outcome. Uh, that's why we can pull out uh, given your uh, covariates. And then based on the smoothness, this thing is non-zero. That means we can cancel out. This is actually the, uh, you know, the propensity function. So then we can have this. We get to the same thing for the, the uh, control case. And then we have, we can, 
expand the expecta expectation in this way. And then uh, we can pull out the potential outcome out of this you know, uh, conditional expectation. And then we can cancel this by smoothness. That's how you get it. So, so this actually is nice. Uh, we can, if you are looking at unadjusted samples, it's positively correlated. However, if you weight them differently, uh, based uh, inversely with the propensity function, then you can have more weights on the top and you can have more weights on the bottom. And then, and then you can actually have a recover uh, this uh, inverse correlation relationships. And the, the same idea can be applied to a weighted uh, least square approximation. So basically it's the same regression function, but uh, using this uh, uh, propensity. So for the, for the treated group, we can use the uh, one over propensity. For untreated group, we, we use the one over one minus one propensity. And then we can weight each individual, uh, each sample differently then we minimize this least square problems of regression, then we can recover causal effect. So as you can see, the weighted uh, linear model actually recovers this uh, actual uh, causal effect. The, yeah, and then, so, so far, this is a wrap up. The counterfactual reasoning is more or less like the imputing uh, potential outcomes. You have a lot of zero uh, missing spots and then using um, the causal assumptions, we will want to fill in those missing spots and then recover this causal effects. So any questions so far? Okay, so that's the kind of, that, that's a, one of the sort of like a uh, tautological tool, uh, but, uh, but uh, recently the, the causal inference has been really popularized and it's beginning to be really popularized in the machine learning community as well. Um, and they, they are also interested in uh, a lot of uh, biological problems, uh, especially genetics problems. And this is one paper from uh, published in Jess, JASA. And this is a, basically GWAS. So can you find uh, uh, correlate uh, causal association between uh, variant A, I of M with the uh, outcome, which is in this case disease. So however, the problem is there's a confounder which confounds the disease outcome and the genetic variants in this case. So, and then they assume that the, what they assume is basically there's no single cause confounder that's only particularly targeting particular variant and then and, and, and the potential outcome of some um, disease. And the key idea is actually very, uh, it's a reminiscent of the, what we do in GWAS actually. So the key idea is that first we estimate the matrix factorization of this A matrix, which is SNP matrix. And then they estimate the potential outcome of Y of A as a function of the factors they learn by matrix factorization. And then they look at the difference between the causal effects, the so treated versus untreated. So that's how they do it. But this is a very similar to what we do uh, in a population uh, structure correction in uh, GWAS. Can I, have, can I ask a clarifying question? Yes. So in this setting, the only thing that I can think you could be like uh, just concretely would be ancestry. So yes. that essentially just they're trying to account for right. something like ancestry. Exactly, yeah. Primarily all the potentially multi cause confounded structure is a primarily uh, some sort of bottleneck effect in population migration. So, or, or some, yeah, some ancestry and yes, those are major concerns. Um, another thing uh, I also noticed, it, this is also a very popular method uh, uh, in uh, causal inference uh, community is uh, Bayesian non-parametric modeling of causal inference. So the idea is that basically, like I mentioned before, uh, counterfactual reasoning is more or less uh, imputation. So, but you want to impute uh, a treated and an untreated uh, independently, uh, separately. So if you break this you know, potential outcome expectation uh, with the conditional expectation, then you, you end up having this 
and this. Uh, for you have two functions. Function one is for the treated group. Function two is untreated group. Then you, you need to estimate this regression estimation of, uh, of y given x. Um, and then what uh, Jennifer Hill did is basically she introduced uh, Bayesian additive uh, regression trees. Uh, and it's just a very powerful method to fit some nonlinearity. Uh, if you, in this for example, she showed that uh, there's a relationship between X and Y. So it's kind of increasing. But if you separately fit the regression curve for a treated group and an untreated group, you have a, a two different uh, curve, nonlinear curve. And then what's nice thing about that is uh, we can actually measure each individual level treatment effect. So basically it's the gap between two curves and then all, almost all the individuals are nicely line up uh, on the nonlinear curve. So for this first individual, you, has a, you have a difference between uh, treated and untreated. And then in the middle, you have a difference between untreated and untreated. So that, that will give you some nice um, data for causal inference. And then the, if you are interested in the average effect, then you can just simply take the average of all these differences. So, so, the, so then I'll be carrying out the same idea as this so for in the single cell genomics uh, analysis. So yes, so then I'll, we'll switch the gear to a single cell differential expression analysis. So if there's no any question, then I'll just move on. Okay, so first uh, it's, um, I have to clarify uh, that uh, what I mean by causal differential expression analysis. So this is a kind of my view of, uh, you know, causal diagram of the disease mechanism starting from the germline genetics. And there's some driver genes that can be affected by environment, environmental factor. And then there's also different cellular context. And then that, that sort of, you know, change your predisposition of disease. And there's also some uh, biological and technical covariates that may affect your disease uh, measurement. And there's a, some downstream gene genes that are sort of affected or, or sort of uh, could be feedback type of uh, correlation with the disease. Um, so these are the modulated gene, which I call it. And there's a confounder that can affect both disease and your modulated genes that you wanna identify. And there's also clearly cellular context is affecting this relationship between disease and the gene. So the, I, the, the goal of this work is I want to sort of ba basically decorrelate this confounder relationship between the modulated gene and then potential biological and technical covariates. Can you clarify a question? Yes, please. So here, um, is there a reason why environmental factors should be separate from cellular context? Like anything that's not genetics, that's biological, can, can it just be in one group? Right, right. So. I, yeah, I guess uh, so. In, this is probably more uh, biased <laughs> based on the fact that I, I'm in the cancer center. So, so environmental factors are more like, uh, you know, mutagens. So mm -hmm. cellular context is more like a, you know, it could be cellular composition or it could be some, uh, yeah, trans effect too. So you know, kind of, it's, uh, it's kind of more broad term. So, but it, so since I'm working on single cell, so I, I think, uh, yeah. I use the cell, cellular context. Okay, but like statistically, they're treated kind of. I mean, they're, yes. they're the same. And then, um, uh, is, so is there assumption that the biological, technical covariates only impact modulated genes and not the driver genes? Yes. Um, so the yeah, it's it's actually a very good question. I. Um, so this uh, biological and covariate is uh, mostly introduced by study design or, or the data set specific uh, factors it's, it's, I, I wanna mention. And the uh, driver gene, which I call it, is more like a inherited uh, fact, uh, disease mechanisms. So, so yeah. So I think that in order to answer to uh, these driver genes, uh, I think we need more, we need the connection with the genetics. So 
this is a more like a genetic predisposition type of uh, contribution to the disease. But this is a more like um, uh, outcome. Uh, the disease is affecting the gene expression and then the disease affected gene also, you know, make your disease more aggra aggravate your disease more severely and, and so on. So this is more like a downstream uh, relationship. Yeah, so yeah, th this was a really uh, tricky to define in a concrete manner mathematically. So yeah, this, this is maybe this diagram is my assumption too. So, so uh, yeah, so the, before we discuss the causal relationship between disease and gene expressions, and um, I, I, I wanna mention the, the single cell data that we normally profile in disease cohort has uh, three levels of uh, you know, groups. So first level is more like an individual level group. So you could have a case and control uh, multiple ind individuals. And the second level is actually then within each individual, you profile many, many cells. And there's definitely another group, which is a cell type groups. So it could be cell state or cell types. So it's a heterogeneous uh, mixture, cell mixture. And then different individuals, you would have a different compositions. So between case and control, you could have a different composition. So yeah, that's uh, level two. And level three is actually, and then within each cell, uh, within each cell type, you, you would have uh, many cells. Then you have a single cell gene expression profiles, many cells and many genes. Here, I, in, in each cell, I, I sort of assume it's like a bag of words. So I don't see strong correlation uh, between the genes and between the, uh, between the cells within each cell type. Uh, but definitely gene-gene expression, uh, gene-gene correlation is important factor. But in single cell data, our data is pretty sparse. So we don't really capture that relationship uh, uh, faithfully. So the, and then the, what's typical uh, statistician's question is, uh, uh, what is the sample size? So for, uh, if you're asking about the questions on the cell types, I think you're asking on the question on the level two. So, Basically, your cell type is uh, the sample size is the number of cells per cell type. So we have we have a lot of cells in, in based uh, thanks to the technology. So, uh, but you have to worry about the batch effect that could you know potentially arise uh, between different individuals or between or disease control groups. Uh, but we generally have a large sample size, uh, and the third level question is basically uh, more like differential expression type of analysis uh, question. So in this case, your sample size is definitely way less than uh, the cells per cell type. Uh, but however, it's very tempting to claim that your sample size is number of cells. So yeah, so it's very tempting. Uh, and then the, but the, but the problem is that cells are, they're not independent, identically distributed within each cell type. So, because they have a higher level of structure up there. So, and then the problem is, another problem is you, we usually have a very few individuals for single cell data sets. So usually the number of individuals sort of uh, dominate your statistical power. Uh, so then the, yeah, and then somebody actually asked the same, same question on more EQTL setting. And what's the best strategy uh, for designing single cell experiment, whether you want to do deep sequencing and fewer individuals, whether you want to do shallow sequencing with the more individuals. Uh, and then the, uh, and this is a paper by uh, Bogdan Pasenyuk and uh, Iran Halperin uh, in Nature Communication. And they actually look at the the, the statistical power. And then the, what they found is, uh, yeah, it's, it's better to do shallow sequencing uh, by multiplexing, for example, and then, but you need to capture more individuals because your variation is mostly on individuals. Uh, so, so that's why uh, uh, that we need to design the method that's more or less using some sort of pseudo bulk uh, data. Pseudo bulk, what I mean by pseudo bulk is that you have a, cell type for each individual, and then you aggregate cells and create the pseudo bulk data for each individual and for each cell type. So uh, 
so that's the kind of setting. So the, let me, let, let's reuse the same notation, W for uh, individual uh, disease assignment, case and control. And the Y is a single cell gene expression. But uh, since we are interested in comparing pseudobulk data, which is, uh, I, I denoted by lam lambda, the rate, um, the individual I and individual I, but then you have a cell J. So many cells per individual for each cell type. Uh, there's some sequencing depth, which I parameterized by rho. Uh, the, our idea is, uh, our goal is to compare the lambda that's uh, generated by causal mechanism and then non-causal genes that's independent of the label assignment of individuals. So uh, the obvious uh, estimate that we, we can use is uh, just the mean of uh, for the pseudo, basically pseudobulk expression itself. So which actually works pretty well. So I'll, I'll show you uh, in the benchmark analysis. Um, um, yeah, and then people came up with a lot of, uh, you know, state of the art single cell differential expression analysis method. But, uh, you know, first uh, they measure whether the method can correctly control type one error. And then what they found is a t-test and the Wilcoxon uh, rank sum test uh, on the pseudobulk profile actually controls uh, false discovery rate uh, pretty well. And, uh, and then in terms of power, so uh, yeah, for a high false discovery you know, rate uh, method, they also, you know, they achieve pretty decent power. Uh, but the problem is that your, 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 your false discovery is like super high. Um, and then for low false discovery rate method, and then they also still, they still find the uh, t-test and the Wilcoxon on the suitable profiles performs pretty well. So it's like, so almost all method works pretty well, uh, moderately. And, uh, and overall the comparison is, uh, you know, those three methods is, is good in, in many of their criteria. And then, the, and then they conclude the paper, like a method uh, was developed for bulk RNA-seq analysis it still works best uh, in a single cell sequencing data. So that's what, the, that's what they claim. And these papers are based on um, kind of synthetic experiments or is it based on some sort of gold standard knowledge on which genes should be differentially expressed? Yes, uh, they, I think they investigate both. Uh, so they, simulate the data based on actual data. So, so a lot of the rate parameters uh, and the sequencing depth they generated based on the real data. And then they also, yeah, take a look at the consistency. So it's just a kind of a consistency is basically, you know, whether your discovery is uh, consistent with the other methods, so and so on. So t-test is not that stable, so it's not that good, but, and the Wilcoxon is not that good in terms of consistency. Uh, uh, the consistent, they're good, uh, but they're, 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 they cannot handle the complex designs. Like sometimes your real data ha requires more uh, covariates, but uh, those two statistical method, you know, doesn't have a parameter for that. Uh, yeah, this is a, this may be outdated. It's a 2018 result. So there may be some better method. Let me briefly introduce uh, what I think is what I can contribute to this uh, differential expression analysis on single cell. So my, my primary goal is interested in comparing the pseudobulk uh, lambda GI of treated versus lambda GI of untreated G for gene and I for individual. And then this is our goal. Um, and the idea is it's very similar to what the, the outcome regression uh, did. So basically we can break the uh, expectation into two uh, nested expectation. And we need to estimate function one for disease, uh, lambda GI of one, and the lambda GI of zero for each individual. That's the goal. So how do we do that? It's the kind of more algorithmic question. Um, so first, I sort of uh, parameterized uh, more uh, to, to make the inference much easier. So lambda GI of disease group, I parameterized by the product of mu GI uh, as a function of XI and the delta GI for so disease effect, which I denoted. 
uh, and uh, uh, control group, I have uh, only mu g i of x i. So this, uh, this is my uh, parameterization for the pseudobank. And then, uh, then we, need to we need to impute them somehow. So how do we impute? Uh, so the, the one of the most uh, successful met strategy in single cell is uh, K nearest neighborhood. <laughs> so, so I use the K nearest neighborhood, yes. I'm sorry, I just wanted to interrupt you for a moment. Um, I'm a little bit confused about the X's. Are the X's cell type? Is that what no. that represents or is it some other variable? Some other confounding variables. So okay. in this case, uh, we don't know yet. So it's, okay. it's, a, it's an unknown confounding variable. Thank you. Yep, thank you. So then uh, we have a basically case cells and control cells for each, for each individual eye. Uh, let's say this is a cell that we are interested in. And then in order to, instead of finding neighbors in the same label, uh, let's find neighbors on the different label. So yj is the cell j. And then we want to look at the cells neighboring uh, to j, which is yk, in the control uh, groups of cells uh, that in this case. So if you, so, and then you mix case and control together, then you can have and find neighbors in this way. In the, the the assumption is the yeah in general you're matching uh, uh, across different groups disease groups they they do match pretty well so that's a kind of a assumption for most of the genes. So, however, if your uh, in different if your gene is really causal, there's a significant disease effect. That means there's a significant difference, a systematic difference between uh, case and uh, imputed control. For example, so there's a direction, direction and effect for this gene, but for the most of the genes, it will it will look like this. That means, uh, you know, you if you do matching based on the spectral uh, spectral domain, then you'll be able to match, you'll be able to establish your uh, control basis for imputation. However, for the control genes, uh, the causal genes, you get the significant difference between case and control. Um, the so the yeah, and that's the the basic idea. So the overall, the pipeline is uh, I think it's a straightforward in some sense. But uh, unfortunately, there's no single model that can you know do all the task. Uh, uh, I couldn't think about it. So maybe it's uh, one one way. To, you know, you know, people can improve a lot. So step one is basically uh, I do counterfactual imputation, basically case and control. And then uh, we estimate uh, imputation function, imputation as a simple uh, Poisson regression uh, in this case. So, but there, there can be other methods. I also consider, uh, you know, non-parametric method, but uh, it, it looks like a Poisson regression is pretty robust in this case. And then using this uh, kind of actually imputed data and then observed data, we can uh, estimate shared compounding effects so for each gene uh, and in each individual. So, and then there's also sequencing depth, uh, different, cell, different samples have a different sequencing depth. And then using, fixing this uh, sort of conditioning on, and then is there any residual effect, sort of dif disease specific differential effect for each individual? So then, then we estimate this. So, uh, so yeah, step one, two, three. So, each step uh, is um, pretty scalable, I would say. So, so it's um, so you, you don't need any clustering or anything. So, uh, the, here's a uh, sort of representative example. This the data set I analyzed was Alzheimer's disease brain data. Um, so, if you compare the pseudobulk profiles between the AD Alzheimer's disease and healthy control you see uh, there's some difference uh, increase in the, on the APOE gene, which is uh, the most uh, famous uh, causal gene of the AD. And, uh, but the p-value is not that significant. It's, um, it, yeah, there's something going on here. Uh, but if you fit the confounder uh, using uh, my method, and then, and then as you can see, confounder has a, a huge variation on the AD specific manner. Uh, but the healthy control, you have some a nice variation too. Uh, yeah, but there's no correlation between AD and healthy. Um, and then 
after you holding uh, the shared compounding effect, you estimate this uh, directional uh, disease effect, and then you see some strong uh, disease effect on the uh, AD groups for this APOEG APO, APO e gene expressions. So this is actually very encouraging to us because the yeah the original paper uh, the actually they report that this was actually discouraging to them. So yeah. Uh, and then to confirm that we, I did, uh, I think I did pretty extensive simulation. So uh, to be more realistic, so I had I generated ten thousand genes. Of them, fifty genes are causal uh, using this uh, relationship. Um, this gamma parameter was fit based on the actual single cell data. So and then, as you can see, the this uh, confounding effect that I estimate is actually very well correlated with the actual confounding effect that I simulated X. And then if you look at the pseudo bonk profiles, there's a sort of also strong correlation between confounding effect I simulated and the pseudo bonk. And for the disease effect, the, the correlation is definitely way weaker than the other two. Uh, for the disease effect uh, side, I have a delta, which is a disease specific, and then I look at the causal genes uh, correlation with the actual, uh, uh, you know, disease uh, suitable profile regressing out this X. And you can see the strong correlation between the Delta and then the total uh, bulk level correlation is not that strong. Uh, confounder is actually getting weaker and weaker as you increase the, uh, the variance of uh, disease effect. On two expressions, so uh, and the benchmark actually showing it's uh, it's uh, consistently it's uh, performing better with the uh, confounder adjustment. So say that all the variables, variables, covariates are confounders like x. There's no b, then all five are acting like this. Then uh, definitely confounder adjustment really works well, and uh, even with the mixing with the batch effects that has nothing to do with the disease label. Uh, I, I, this confounder adjustment is still uh, sort of uh, achieved high power. And uh, yeah, even if you have a strong batch effect uh, for most of, in most cases, only one variable covariate uh, confounder, then we still maintain strong performance, uh, but, it, uh, but it's a little weaker than the other. Um, then this another question is uh, yeah what if you increase the sample size uh, double uh, can you uh, you know can can that be a cure for uh, pseudo bulk analysis without confound adjustment is uh, yeah the answer is no uh, because it's really the causal mechanism that that's really there so then it means that even if you increase the sample size you still have to deal with the confound adjustment as you can see the the variance proportion of variance explained by phenotype is uh, high when it's high. So the nearly double, uh, you know, individual doesn't really help uh, much uh, compared to the individual with the fewer indiv individual. Um, you basically have a very strong performance as a, you know, almost equal to the, what you can get uh, with the sample size doubled. So yeah, so, so far we have looked at this. So this is a data set I uh, analyzed. This was a published 2019. Uh, single cell transcriptomic analysis of Alzheimer's disease. Uh, then uh, I found uh, with the stringent uh, family-wise error correction, nearly 200 uh, genes are differentially regulated with the Alzheimer's disease. And different co uh, the colors, different colors means different uh, cell type annotations. So this is uh, only, I'm only showing those genes that are uh, microglial cell specific uh, differential genes. And then it, it's, uh, it's actually pretty strong result. Uh, I think it's uh, because a lot of them are actually corroborated by known literature. So APOE is definitely 40% heritability is attributed to APOE. And the other genes, there's uh, other evidence like it suggests that uh, the AD has a strong pleiotropy with the depression um, and then BLNK is also participating TRAM2 signaling, which is one of the causal mechanism of the uh, AD, and uh, and also the Alzheimer's disease age of onset uh, can be accelerated by this gene expression LHPFPL2, 
And then also another gene is also interesting because it also explains the pleiotropy with the Parkinson's disease, with the Alzheimer's disease. Uh, and yeah, and then the, there's also cell type specific uh, enrichment of these uh, uh, causal genes. So one thing I found interesting is uh, for ex uh, so layer two and three of cortical layer of excitatory neurons, there's a strong enrichment of, of the microtubule or spindle type of go category. And uh, yeah, and, and then this is, there's also strong uh, uh, experimental result uh, 2003 and 2017, it, which is actually showing that the microtubule density is definitely lower on the Alzheimer's disease, both the gray and white uh, bars and healthy control there's, uh, it's very dense microtubules on the pyramidal neurons. And it is also showing that the, it's really L2 and L3 specific. Uh, as you can see the L5 and L23. So there's a clear difference of the uh, dendritic splines, which is a, uh, regulated by microtubule spindles. And uh, for the microglia and astrocyte uh, genes also highlight the cell cell junction and focal adhesion type of cellular components. Um, yeah, it, it has to do with the uh, amyloid beta clearance mechanism. So the focal adhesion is one, one, one way. The, the glial cells sort of engage with the uh, fib, uh, fib, uh, amyloid beta the, the proteins. And yeah, as you can see in the, in the mouse experiment, they show that the, there's a difference. Uh, yeah, so far we, I've looked at the single cell uh, differential expression analysis and then it's, uh, I wanted to elevate the, the quality of the data the pseudobulk analysis could, could uh, use. So using a counterfactual confounder adjustment. So, and I showed the Alzheimer's disease study results. So yeah, we have uh, five minutes. So. So I will, I will just briefly mention the cell type annotation uh, in the single cell RNA-C problem. So, so, so yeah, so, so far I haven't really discussed how do we get the cell types or single cell data uh, from here. So I, I'm more, uh, you know, co conservative in, to, to the other machine learning people. So this is a typical pipeline of single cell analysis. You have a row data and then count matrix, and then people normally do uh, low dimensional representation. And then somehow they do some clustering and then based on the clustering result, they discover cell types uh, and then. And then if you are more ambitious, you can do more trajectory type of analysis. Uh, but the idea is, uh, yeah, I think that the, I think the one, one Thing I, I would like to uh, add to the cell type annotation problem is uh, you have to deal with the, the right distance measure. So, which I found is um, uh, angular distance between cells seems very robust and it's working well. So somebody also did a similar idea. So, so this is a paper by one of Aviv Reger groups. Uh, basically you can map cells into some sphere. So rather than some Euclidean space. So the, here's a 3D sphere. You can, as you can see, you can nicely lay out all the cells. So this is actually the same thing. We actually measure distance between stars on earth because we're looking at the sky from the sphere. Uh, the, the distance, angular distance is interesting. And also the von Mises first coin uh, distribution for the angular distance. And then the fissure sort of expanded to a high dimensional setting. And uh, it's also the density function looks like this form. So there's exponent uh, and then there's a concentration parameter kappa and the mu is basically the direction of some K. And then there's a normalizing constant. So concentration parameter basically determine whether your, your, your angle and whether you want to put more mass on some point or you're, you want to spread the mass across the sphere. So the, the and then using that uh, distance uh, and von Mises Fisher distribution, and then we can simply do a mixture modeling of the single cell data. Uh, so the, you have a Z, J, K, which is cell type assignment of the cell J, 2K, and then X, G, X, G, J is your marker gene profiles and mu gk is your 
average uh, for Mrs. Fisher parameter for the cell type K, and there's a concentration parameter kappa. Um, and, uh, and then this is, there's a constraint LGK. So this constraint is actually unique thing that uh, different from the, the original von Mises fixture mixture model. So this uh, constraint is actually coming from uh, primary, uh, prior, prior knowledge of the cell type. So you have a genes and cell type, you have a membership, just zero one indicator. So this is a, we, we want to take advantage of this uh, prior knowledge. So the, we can fit this model using uh, EM models, EM, EM algorithm. So, so E step, you can sort of sample your latent membership based on what we have so far. And then M step, you can fit the parameter of mu K for each cell type K. But uh, when we have to add the constraint of this, uh, uh, you know, observations. Uh, this actually simplifies a lot of uh, uh, prof uh, analysis pipelines. So you have a previous pipeline is basically all cells. So you do pre-clustering and the cell type annotation, and then you do sub-clustering and so on. Uh, because in many cases, we have a pretty good uh, set of marker genes. In this case, uh, in brain data, I use the psych encode projects, marker gene uh, memberships. And this, is a, this was very good enough. In our, data, in our analysis, and we can directly use that to constrain L matrix. And then we fit this model, and then we can recover uh, directly from uh, single cell data without doing any clustering. So it turned out to be, it's very strongly correlated with the previous uh, results. So this previous result, and then this new work, almost all cell type, we have a very strong correlation. Let me wrap up. So we can actually do use this method and then we can dig in deeper. Uh, so excited neuron, we can do uh, excited neuron, we can do more clustering on the excited neurons. Inhibited neurons, we can do more clustering of the layers. That's how we do it. Uh, so if you're lucky, you, to, you, should, you, should, you should do that. Uh, but in many cases, uh, there's also strong batch effect. That means you have to address that. So I don't have time to discuss that. So I'll skip that. So the, I basically, after you adjust the batch effect, you can use the same method. You can you know, recover pretty well. This is a study on the T cell study. So uh, for this memory T cell, uh, T rec populations, uh, we, we will be able to inc uh, adjust the batch effect. And then among the memory T rec, we can dig deeper using this method and then we can also subclassify different subpopulations of regulatory T cells. And then it turned out that uh, it's very effective that the uh, TREC17 seems uh, very strong correlation uh, genes for DBIT4. It's differentially regulated between uh, healthy and the multiple sclerosis patients. So, so that was it. So, and then the, I just want to um, wrap up. So, so the, uh, the take a message I, I found in the single cell analysis, uh, it's, it's a kind of moving fast. So, but uh, th there's less uh, statistical checking or, or something like that. So, but there's, that means there's also another room that uh, many people can contribute to. Uh, but uh, yeah, basically if you, it's okay to break the, uh, some, something, uh, I guess, but uh, yeah, unless you break it, you, you will not be able to understand the single cell data. So finally, summary is uh, I introduced the uh, causal inference framework. Um, and then I used the counterfactual uh, compound adjustment for differential expression analysis. And then I also briefly mentioned the cell type annotation on uh, angular space. So these are wonderful people I collaborated with. Uh, Mostly the collaboration is from my uh, postdoc research. So Li Hui and Hans Rudy basically generated all the single cell uh, data and Manon Scalis and then all the other members also contributed experimental components and Liang and uh, Tomo and uh, Matt, uh, that we are working together uh, on the T cell biology problems. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Yangjin. So because we're at the top of the hour, um, I think uh, people that have to leave can leave, but if you have uh, a few more minutes to stick around, yes, um, if other people that um, can stay have questions, and yeah. I actually have a few questions myself. 
Thank you okay. so much for the next talk. So one is about your um, APOE result on the gene expression side. Yes. Um, if you can go back to that um, Manhattan yes. plot where you have in your genes that you, um, your model is identifying as being causal. Mm -hmm. um, I wonder if you've done some comparison, you know, like per gene before and after, like just a regular t-test p-value and your model's p-value. Is there some sort of correlation between those and are there more genes that you identify as causal compared to what would be the number of significant with um, t-test and, and so on? Yes, uh, yeah, there, there is a correlation. So we don't really, you know, create some <laughs> new genes. Uh, yeah. Well, I mean, in the case of APOE, you, that is a new gene, right? So yeah, yes. it was yeah. not significant and now it's significant. Yeah, but I wonder if this is kind of an outlier or it's, um, yeah. Yeah, so yeah, that, that's actually, Probably related to uh, uh, it, uh, you know, based on the reviewers' uh, <laughs> comments. So it's very similar to the, what the suggested. And then, yeah, I actually look at the first. Uh, there, there's some way, you know, that could go wrong. So uh, I could overcorrect the data, and then I could somehow create some highlight some uh, some noise. So in that case, uh, we can actually look at the. Uh, uh, you know, the degree of uh, variance, whether it is really shrinking to some uh, variance. And then, but the answer is, uh, it depends on genes. Some genes, uh, it, it could create some, uh, some case, uh, troublesome cases. In that case, I filter out those genes. So if, uh, if that uh, significantly reduce the variance, uh, then it's mostly due to the low read count per gene. And mm -hmm. that, that I filter out. And uh, in many cases, uh, effect size directions don't really change. Mm -hmm. So they sort of, it's robust. Uh, mm -hmm. But the problem is uh, uh, in the APOE case, this, I didn't show the results here, but uh, if you look at the correlation between the identified estimated compounder with uh, sex, M sex, and then you see strong correlation. So it turned out that uh, there's a, uh, uh, you know, sex bias on the APOE genes. Uh, mm -hmm. There's a more, uh, you know, expression on the uh, females, if I remember correctly. So, yeah. So, okay. I, it, and, which and is I, a, you know, off the top of your head, do you know how many, in, like, how many, like, on the orders of mine, so how many genes did you have that you know, were not significant and then after adjustment became significant? Um, so, to get so, a sense of, yeah. you know, how, how, so yeah, so, yeah. yeah. So, so uh, for just, just based on this uh, single nucleus RNA seq data, um, uh, I have to admit that there, there is uh, um, very few genes that are, you know, genomic significant. So, and then the, I think in the paper, nature paper, uh, you know, they uh, actually, they, they are immunologists. <laughs> so they report the, uh, uh, results, uh, cell level result. So instead of individual pseudobulk level result, because they found that pseudobulk is not very powerful for uh, differential expression analysis. So that actually created a lot of criticism from the reviewers. So, uh, but uh, yeah, but the, our argument at the time was, uh, you know, the directionality is, is consistent. Uh, it only, it only, it, it's only the matter of uh, sample size. So we just reported cell cell based uh, association, but I don't I don't I don't buy that result hundred percent. So yeah, so yeah I don't think so. Basically, yeah, with uh, without adjustment we get like tens of genes for microglia, for example, because microglia is a fewer read count, mm -hmm. uh, but we get hundreds. Uh, nearly 100 for uh, this compound adjustment for oh, new ones. So, okay, so, you know, I, I was assuming that it would be the other way. So I guess from what I'm hearing from you is that you actually, you're underpowered because there's all these confounders that are introducing variability. And then once you account for them, you actually see more things correlated with the outcome. Right. So I, I thought it would be the other way around. Like all everything is pretty much looks correlated because it's the same confounder that correlates with Gene expression and outcome, and then once you account for it, yeah, then you yeah. see fewer but, things. But like, it's yeah. not like it was the other way around. Okay, but, but yeah, for the T cell, it's the other way. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm wondering if anybody else has.
questions? I have a quick question. Yes, please. So for the confounder effects you identified and trying to adjust, mm -hmm. have you actually uh, checked those confounder effects to see if they are correlated with some covariance you have? Yes, I, I did. So the it's primarily sex is actually a big component for this data set. So, and also there's some, depending on genes, some genes are also uh, age specifically correlated. And then, yeah, some, some genes are more sex specifically correlated. So yeah, it really depends on the gene, but I didn't see global trend. I see, thank you. Uh, okay, I also had another question. Yes, please. It yes. uh, goes back to this uh, multiple cause model by David Bly. Yeah. Uh, I, I'm just curious on like a practical level, if you apply that model to like, yeah, is there anything different than what people do in a standard way, like you've listed here, adjust for PCs. Um, I mean, the <laughs> math is a little bit different, but yes. practically, do you, like, are the results different? So they demonstrate, in the paper, they demonstrate that it's uh, better than um, uh, prices eigenstruct. Uh, and also it's better than mass defense uh, Bayesian, uh, you know, regression model. So yes, uh, it looks like it's improving, but, uh, but I'm a little worried about uh, um, the, the way they estimate uh, compounder. So yes, this is definitely a strong compounder, but I, I don't think it's really helping much. Uh, but the another uh, assumption is uh, they, are, they don't take into account of LD structure. So, which is a little troublesome to me. So, so yeah, so that's a, probably one thing we can improve, yeah. So do you have a sense then why does it improve the eigenstrat? Um, I think that it's a, so there, there, I think that it's a, it, there, I don't think there is a one factor. So one factor, I think it's a, uh, the compounder estimation, they use different factorization methods. <laughs> so, so that, that actually works better because it's really handling the count data, mm -hmm. SNP012. And another thing is, uh, yeah, they, when they estimate the causal effect, so instead of regressing out, they sort of really construct a more uh, sensitive uh, baseline. Uh, between the, you know, allele is on or allele is off. So they have a more sensitive uh, baseline model. So, but uh, regressing out, seem, it's mathematically, should mathematically do the same. But uh, yeah, but uh, yeah, another thing which is nice is uh, it, it's a pretty robust to the number of PC components. So, so yeah. They're not really regressing out, so it's, it seems more robust in, in that sense. Right, and then the yeah uh, another another thing they yeah they don't really answer much is uh, you know those uh, multiple cause factors uh, compounders are whether they are really affecting all the slips or all the or only the power of the slips, they don't really handle that cases you know, systematically. So they are assuming that it's probably pr primarily all the, all the slips. So, yeah. If there are no questions, then um, thank you so much, Yang. Thank you, it's yeah. Very helpful uh, lecture on causal inference and single cell and uh, combination. <laughs>